Greetings, we're going to talk here about postoperative UTI. And postoperative UTI is one of the many causes of postoperative fever. It tends to occur in postoperative day 3 to 5, so 72 to 120 hours after uh, the operation has taken place. Remember that if you have a fever that is shortly after the operation within 24 hours, that tends to be normal. Um, if you have a fever uh, within the first couple days, that tends to be atelectasis or pneumonia. Uh, and this is just sort of a rough, uh, a rough uh, overview. Uh, but the, uh, the UTI tends to occur in the three to five day postoperative period. So we're going to talk about the postoperative UTI, and then we'll go over a couple clinical strategies to uh, hopefully reduce the uh, occurrence of postoperative UTI. So here's a vignette. You're making your morning rounds and visit a morbidly obese 38-year-old woman who has recently had a Ruin Y gastric bypass surgery. She's postoperative day three. She's had a 10-year history of diabetes mellitus type 2, for which she takes metformin. She complains of suprapubic tenderness, which she thinks came on gradually overnight. Vital signs, uh, blood pressure 135 over 95, heart rate 87, respirations 12, temperature 101.7. Surgical incision sites appear clean and well-dressed. Lung sounds are clean, clear to auscultation. Extremities appear normal. Foley catheter is placed which uh, was originally inserted when she was in the OR for her surgery. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Well, I guess I don't have a following here. So what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? You should be able to, should be able to get this pretty clearly. Probably on the USMLE, they would tell you uh, which of the following is the next best step. But... The most likely diagnosis here is postoperative UTI. And the reason that it's likely postoperative UTI is that she's post-op day three, which means that uh, day three, usually what you would be most likely to have if you have a postoperative fever would be pneumonia, aspiration, uh, or UTI. Uh, if it's pneumonia or aspiration, the, the symptoms would probably be pulmonary, and in this case, she has lung sounds that are clear to auscultation. You can always have wound infection. Wound infection tends to occur later on, but either way, her surgical incision sites appear clean and well-dressed. Um, what really makes us think UTI here, and we're going to see, is that she has a Foley catheter, and it's been there for three days. And she also has diabetes mellitus type 2, and she's a female, which are other risk factors for getting a UTI. So all of those together make us think that this is most likely a UTI. The culprits for postoperative UTI are the same culprits that we have in any kind of UTI. So E. coli, Proteus mirabilis, and the coagulase negative Staphylococcus, which includes Staph epidermidis, and Staph saprophyticus, which is part of the, uh, part of the flora in uh, the vagina. And then, of course, the Foley catheter, which we use for good reasons during surgery because it helps the patient void when they otherwise may not be able to, and in the subsequent postoperative period when they may not be able to. Uh, however, the Foley catheter is a perfect vector to introduce bacteria into the bladder, and that's going to cause a urinary tract infection. As a matter of fact, 5% every day you increase your risk of getting an urinary tract infection so that by the time you've had a Foley catheter in for a week, your risk for a urinary tract infection is up by 35%. So a Foley catheter itself is a risk factor for UTI. So Foley catheters can be evil the longer they're left in. They're a good thing, don't get me wrong, they serve a purpose but they're overused uh, and they're uh, oftentimes they're kept in way longer than necessary. So the postoperative UTI. UTI is the most frequent healthcare associated complication. I think it makes up some 40% of nosocomial infections. 
and uh, clearly it's associated with the prolonged use of Foley catheter. It increases, the risk of UTI increases 5% each day the Foley is inserted, and the risk also increases uh, with urinary retention. So we kind of have to balance that. We want to make sure that we're not keeping the Foley in too long, but we also want to make sure that when we take the Foley out that the patient is able to void normally because if they're not able to void normally and they're retaining urine, that's also going to increase their risk of a UTI. So yes, remove the Foley as soon as you can, but remove it as uh, when it's appropriate. And generally, it's appropriate to remove the Foley catheter within two days. Only a minority of patients uh, will you need to keep the Foley catheter in for greater than two days. And that's, of course, going to be the very sick patients and uh, patients who've had pelvic surgery. The traditional risk factors for UTI also increase the risk for postoperative UTI, so female sex, older age, diabetes mellitus, immunodeficiency, uh, or a personal history of multiple UTIs. Symptoms include fever, urgency, frequency, dysuria, suprapubic tenderness, chills, lethargy, vomiting. So patients who have a Foley in, they may not have the urgency, frequency, dysuria feelings. They may just have the suprapubic tenderness because, of course, they're not making an attempt to urinate. So it, it, they may not have this frequency or dysuria. They may just have the suprapubic tenderness. So uh, they don't necessarily have to have all of these. But the fever, of course, is going to be important. Chills is just reflective of the fever. Lethargy and vomiting sort of later on if the fever's been going on for a while. So these are just general symptoms. None of these are uh, more common than the other, but the suprapubic tenderness is quite specific to the UTI. Now remember, if, if we're talking down the road, maybe post-operative day four or five, then you start getting into your walking or your wound uh, problems, so DVT, pulmonary embolism, surgical site infection. So you've got to keep in mind multiple different things uh, if you have a post-operative fever, but the suprapubic tenderness will really give it away. Uh, the diagnosis, if the UTI is suspected, the best initial step is going to be urinalysis and culture. And from this point on, we're pretty much going to uh, diagnose this just like a traditional UTI. So as mentioned, our symptoms here, and then the diagnosis, we're going to get a urinalysis and a culture. The lab findings with your uh, routine labs that you would be getting every morning, CMP, CBC, you should probably start to see elevated white cells on your CBC. With your urinalysis, you're certainly going to see elevated white cells. Uh, nitrites should be positive, and culinary forming uh, units should be more than 10 to the fifth per milliliter. Culture will also be positive. However, these things we might not get right away. So if you have white blood cells greater than five and positive nitrites in a patient who has clinical symptoms of UTI, uh, you should certainly treat them. Uh, please note that a post-operative UTI or really any catheter-associated UTI is considered a complicated UTI, so the medical management is going to be different. This is not the same as your typical UTI that a woman gets just out uh, on an outpatient basis. This is indeed a much, this is a different UTI that we have to treat differently, and I'll explain that. So we're going to treat this, well, let me say how we would normally treat a UTI. So how, how would you normally treat a UTI if a woman comes in to the outpatient clinic and says that she's had frequency and urgency and she's got maybe a low-grade fever um, and she's got a urinalysis that shows white cells and nitrites? How would you normally treat that? You would give her uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or nitrofurantoin. You do not do that for the post-operative or the catheter-associated UTI. So for these patients, we treat them with third-generation cephalosporins or a fluoroquinolone. Uh, you can also use an aminoglycoside. Uh, so all three of those are choices. The aminoglycoside uh, has a, a usefulness because you only have to take it once a day, but most commonly in the hospital, 
Uh, what you're going to see used are the third generation cephalosporin, like rocephin or cefotaxime, uh, or uh, fluoroquinolone, which we use ciprofloxacin. And basically the rule of thumb is ciprofloxacin for anything below the diaphragm, uh, levofloxacin for anything above the diaphragm. I think that's how it works. So, uh, but any of these are good choices. You should never be asked to choose between any two of these on the USMLE. So I would expect you'd be given maybe penicillin, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, nitrofurantoin, ceftriaxone, and something else. So third generation cephalosporin or an aminoglycoside or a fluoroquinolone. And then of course to remove the Foley if possible. What I would do is if there's no other contraindications, which is usually not, remove the Foley and then make sure that they're voiding. Some complications that can come out of postoperative UTI or really any UTI are pyelonephritis. With pyelonephritis, the symptoms are going to continue. The patient will also complain of flank pain. That is not a symptom of uh, UTI, uh, you, either complicated or uncomplicated. So if the patient has flank pain, it's probably it probably means that their UTI has been around for a long time and it's ascended. So in that case, you should get an ultrasound to check for pyelonephritis. Uh, however, generally when the patients are in the hospital, it doesn't get to that point. With a perinephric abscess, you'll have protracted symptoms longer than five days. These patients will tend to have a flank or abdominal mass as well as the pain. In this case, you're going to get ultrasound. You're also going to want to have a CT or MRI because surgical drainage is going to be necessary. Uh, with the postoperative UTIs, it's very rare to see these kinds of complications because uh, if we haven't have already removed the Foley catheter, um, once the patient has the symptoms, has the fever, we know to get the Foley catheter out of there or to start the patient on antibiotics. But these are your complications that you can get from any UTI. So I figured it's important to know this. And some clinical strategies I've alluded to already. Aseptic technique of catheter placement. So if there's bacteria on the catheter before you place it in, there's going to be bacteria on the catheter after you place it in, and that can colonize the bladder and cause a UTI. So make sure you're using a good aseptic technique. And then for the majority of patients, catheters should be removed within 48 hours. So in that uh, post-operative to 48-hour period, you should be asking yourself with every patient, if they have a catheter in, should it still be in? Because if it's still in, you better have a reason for it. And that's it.